Hey guys, oh, welcome back to Genji Plans. Today's video, I wasn't planning on filming today, but here we are. The rest of my family tested positive for COVID yesterday, so the baby and I are stuck here in the bedroom uh, for the week, basically. Um, and so I thought I would film today my birth story. Um, he is three weeks old yesterday as of filming, but I think this is going out next week. Um, he was born on April 25th. Um, so this story is like three weeks old in my head. I used this insert from my um, pregnancy bundle, which is on my website, ganshiplans.com slash shop. This is insert number 40, which is um, the pregnancy bundle. And there's a labor notes page, which I know like there's a lot of stuff in that pregnancy bundle that's very like planner people, um, which, you know, that's who we are. That's great. If that's not you, then don't use it. Um, but I wanted to use this insert to sort of keep track for myself and I went over it with my husband the day after to make sure that I didn't forget anything um, because I wanted to be able to tell the story to you to people in my family um, my sister wanted to hear the story my friends you know who are the same around the same age I like hearing birth stories and I wanted to share mine so that's what we're doing today um, I this is my third baby uh, my second VBAC um, all three have been hospital births obviously the first the c-section was in a hospital um, she was breech so she had a scheduled C-section on her due date. My second baby was a, um, like I said, a VBAC. She, we, I went into labor naturally with her, um, or spontaneously, um, at 40 weeks and two days. Um, and I was in labor with her for like 18 hours or something in the hospital. Um, but all in all went pretty well, was unmedicated. Uh, so my third baby, uh, I, I knew that I could go unmedicated. But I kind of, for whatever reason, when I was experiencing my second labor, it didn't feel like pain. I was experiencing it as pressure, as intensity, but not as pain. There's a lot of things I couldn't articulate to myself at the time. Um, and so that, I think, helped my experience and helped me go unmedicated. But the thing is, I remember it as pain. And so when I was thinking back on the experience of my second labor, I knew I could do it again if I needed to. Um, but I also like felt a lot more fear going into my third labor um, for whatever reason. And so I almost, uh, in retrospect, I feel like I, I mean, I, I knew at the time that I was leaning farther over towards an epidural than I was the first time. Um, so that's my mindset going in. Um, the second labor, I was like, I had a heart out date because my OB did not want to induce me. She said that if I went up to 41 weeks that she would do a scheduled C-section again. Um, and that ended up getting scheduled for 41 plus four, or sorry, for, for 40 plus four. So I was like two days shy uh, when I actually had her and it was uh, pretty stressful trying to like do home induction techniques in time. This time I did not have that hard out date. He actually said that the OB I had this time said that he would do induction on me if, if it came to that. Um, the only thing was that my husband kind of wanted to have an April baby instead of a May baby. His birthday's in May, our anniversary is in May, Labor Day and all, uh, or not Labor Day, Memorial Day. Just there's more stuff going on in May. It's always a busy month for us. So he wanted it to be in April instead seems like a reasonable thing to me, whatever. It was like a, a soft uh, thing that we were like, yeah, sure, it would be great if it was in April. Um, but it wasn't something we were hard and fast about, but that was the urgency I felt. <laughs> I was doing a lot of the labor tech or induction techniques, like the home stuff, ras red raspberry leaf tea, dates. And I think I really do attribute dates um, because they're supposed to soften your cervix. And I was pretty effaced early on, like 80% effaced early on um, at, let's see, on the 18th. What was that? 70% effaced, um, like a week before. Even though I was I was like one centimeter, one centimeter, three centimeters um, early on, nothing intense uh, dilation-wise, but I was, um, I was effaced a lot, so dates. I was doing um, just a lot of walking and then the mile circuit, uh, which I did a couple of times, like in 37 weeks, I was doing the like 10 minute version where you do like the mile circuit. If you don't know, it's like um, poses 
that it's kind of like a spinning babies type of a thing. And you can Google it and, and learn about it. Um, they say to don't start until you're like 37 weeks. Um, and I was doing the short version. And then um, then I got checked and I was at like minus two station. Is that right? No, minus one station. I'm like, that's pretty good and engaged. Like, I don't want him to to go higher, right? That was my thinking. It's like, I don't want to do the mild circuit because the first one has you doing this inversion. I don't want him to fall out of my pelvis and then get worsely aligned. But anyway, I, oh, so the, this, not even in the labor yet in this story. At 39 weeks and, uh, what was it? It was like two days after, oh, so I had, I had a mute, a membrane sweep. And then two days later, I, no, I didn't have a membrane sweep at that first check. I'm sorry. I do have it written down, but I don't have written down when I had the membrane sweep. Um, that was after. All right. So I was checked at 38 weeks. Um, then I was checked that a the couple days later, two days later, I was losing some mucus plug. So I thought that's a good sign. The other thing that made me think I was going into labor was that I was nauseous. And with my um, second baby, that was the thing that kicked off active labor was throwing up. And I always like, I also threw up like in transition. And so I knew that like, that was something that my, I had always known my body would be that kind of person because I have been known to throw up from menstrual cramps also. Um, so I was like, okay, this is it, right? I'm like, I, I feel nauseous. And when I felt like I needed to throw up, I did. And I was like, okay, I've thrown up now. Um, Labor is going to start, right? And then there were more intense contractions, like from Braxton Hicks up to like a low-level prodromal labor. They started to hurt more and be more crampy. Um, but then like nothing was happening. I threw up a second time. And then 24 hours later, my or 48 hours later I don't know my husband got diarrhea sorry um but I was like oh it was just food poisoning and we don't know whether it was the anchovies or the mushrooms but neither of the girls ate either of those things so it was one of those probably I think it was the anchovies he thinks it was the mushrooms so my body was doing some stuff in reaction to that but it was not going into labor uh, unfortunately. So then two days after that nausea, I had the check where I was three centimeters dilated instead of one. And so he was like, that's great. You know, you're doing, you're doing good. I was 39, or 38 in six days. He did a membrane sweep. I was having some bloody show or, you know, like bleeding from then. And I Googled and it was like, that can cause bleed. You can have bleeding for like three days after a membrane sweep. And so I didn't, I was not able to rule out just the membrane sweep from anything being bloody show, but I was having some consistent spotting from then on until I had the baby. Um, so then three days after that, okay, two days after that it was Sunday night. Um, and I was like, all right, it was the end of spring break. My daughter's going back to school tomorrow. Um, it's 39 weeks. And, you know, I just, I kind of felt like, all right, this, the timing feels right, whatever. <laughs> but also I was like, let's see if we can get the show on the road a little bit more. So I did the mild circuit again, even though I knew it might make him go higher into my pelvis. Hopefully, you know, it would work. I don't know. Um, did that, stayed up a little late to do that, um, went to bed. I had been taking um, Unisom to help me sleep since the night that I was feeling sick. Um, because I knew that I wanted to be well rested, which was the thing I was not with my last baby. Um, so I got some good sleep, woke up, um, in the morning to, you know, get our daughter ready for school. And, uh, she usually comes in and snuggles with us, but she didn't that morning. Um, and so I was like, oh, I have a little bit of time. Let me just grab this peanut ball. Cause it was like in the basket next to the bed. Um, let me just grab it and stick it between my legs and do one of those positions that I've been practicing. Um, and when I did that, I felt a little bit of like a gush. And there had been so much mucus for the that whole week beforehand that I, I was not sure what was happening. And in hindsight, like the gush should have been the thing. And I it was like I knew 
in my head, in my heart of hearts, I, I knew that my water had broken, but I was still in deep denial for hours um, because it was just a tiny little trickle um, besides that. And I was like going back and forth, like, should I go in? Should I not? But I knew I had to play it safe because I was GBS positive. One thing I didn't know before this pregnancy is that you can test positive in your urine way back like in your first month when I was like eight weeks pregnant. Um, and so they said that even if I were to test negative on the swab in my third trimester, <clears throat> that they would still want to put me on an antibiotic. So they didn't do the swab. So that was fun. Um, one less appointment where I had to take off my pants. Um, but I knew that I was GBS positive. So I needed to get in and get my antibiotics because I had made the mistake of Googling. Um, and I read a, a horror story about a, a strep infection in a baby. And I was like, okay, I want to make sure I get these antibiotics before the baby comes. So I knew that with the, um, my water breaking, that the risk of infection was even greater. Um, and the GPS made that even more on top of that. So I was like, okay, I told my husband, I don't know what this is. It may or may not be anything. Um, I'm just going to grab like the small little bag that I had attached to my labor bag. That was just a couple of things that I wanted right away. Um, and I'm going to take her daughter to school. The school, the hospital is on the way back from school. So I'll just go get checked out. And then if it's nothing, I'll come back. And I was like, unless you think that like you want to drop off our, our second daughter with the babysitter and we can both go. He was like, eh, it's all right. There'll be time. I'm like, you're right. There's time. So he was not there for triage this time. Also, he wasn't there for triage last time because of COVID. Um, but it was a good thing that I had the little separate bag because then he was able to do all of the heavy lifting when he finally did join me. Anyway, skipping ahead. I dropped off my daughter and I um, I gave her her, you know, hugs and I love yous. And I deliberately didn't say the words, I'll see you later today. Like, I'll see you this afternoon. Um, because I knew that there was a chance that I would be getting admitted. And so I just didn't say that. I just said, I love you. Goodbye. And it felt so wrong. Um, I didn't tell her or the teachers or anybody that I was going to get checked at the hospital. Um, I just, you know, I called uh, labor and delivery on the way and they said, yep, sure. Come on in. And they put me on the monitors, um, for, I think about 20, 30 minutes of non-stress test. And then, um, they, the midwife came in and the way she did it was she just did a cervical check. She said at that point that I had gone up to 80% effaced, um, and that I was at minus two station. See, I knew that the mild circuit would push him higher up, but it, you know, it broke my water. So I guess that happened. Um, she just did a membrane sweep or not, sorry, just a cervical check and then use the like acid, uh, strip to test, uh, for fluid and she, it turned blue or whatever right away. And she's like, yep, we're staying, you're having a baby today. And labor had not started. Um, my, I think my water broke sometime overnight officially the the time on the chart was six because that was what time I woke up and noticed um but it could have happened at any point overnight um and you know it was such a slow leak that there was no difference you know if you have a big gush I think then suddenly the baby's head's against your cervix and things get started it's my understanding but uh when it was just a slow leak there was still enough of a cushion that nothing was happening so um that's where fortunately the doctor was okay with induction. The nurse is okay with induction, like the midwife was. Um, so they put me on Pitocin. I got started on my um, antibiotics and my Pitocin before my husband made it uh, to the hospital. He went off and dropped off our daughter with the babysitter. Lucky duck. She's, she was 19 months old. Um, she got to go to Disneyland with her, her babysitter who just, that was the day that she was going with her brother. Um, and so she got to see Goofy, I think, and Mouse. I don't know which one. <laughs> so I was happy for her that she got to do that. Um, and we were getting pictures during the early parts of the induction um, when I was still, you know, looking forward to pictures and stuff. Uh, that was fun. So, yeah, I got started on Pitocin around 10, 15 um, in the morning. And it was just kind of going doing its thing they start you at like two it's like microliters per hour i don't know 
two units per hour. Um, and then like half an hour later, it goes up to four. And then they ch asked me if things were getting more intense. And I said they were. Um, so they said, okay, we'll stay here at four for a while. And my husband went down to the cafeteria to get some lunch. I was just kind of, you know, vibing. It was, it was getting more intense, you know, um, but it wasn't unbearable. I was able to, you know, work through it just fine. Um, with our, co our first COVID baby in 2020, they were bringing food up to the labor and delivery room for the support person, um, free meals. And he got like three of them. Cause like I said, it was an 18 hour labor. Um, this time he was allowed to leave and come back. So he was responsible for getting his own food. So he went down and got a burger from the cafeteria, came back. Um, I think while he was down there was when I was noticing that like things were plateauing not stalling, plateauing. So the next time the nurse came in to check on me and adjust the monitors, um, she moved me up to six units of Pitocin. Um, and shortly after my husband, husband got back from lunch, I think it was when the, um, the midwife came in for a check and she went to do a, um, a cervical check and see what was happening. So at that point it was 3 PM, I think, who knows, maybe 2.30 by the time um, she was doing that. It was only, I was only four centimeters dilated, still 80%, still minus two. Um, and so that was kind of discouraging, but I knew that things had been, you know, going slowly so far. Like I could tell that things were going slowly. I wasn't surprised and I wasn't really disheartened to see that it was four uh, centimeters. But the thing that was crazy was that I don't know whether it was the six units of Pitocin starting to kick in, whether, you know, on like a delay, whether it was changing positions to get up onto the bed for the cervical check, or whether it was the cervical check itself, which like side note, they need to invent a midwife with no knuckles. Those things are crazy. Cervical checks when you're in labor hurt and they trigger contractions. And then you've got somebody up there while you're having a contraction and it's intense and miserable and uncomfortable. Anyway, for whatever of those reasons, things started to get really intense. Um, suddenly, like all of a sudden, um, I was laboring there in the bed for a little while. It was starting to radiate into my legs. Um, I was having my husband push on my knees and I was pushing down on my legs and that was helping a little bit, but my body was really starting to fight the contractions. I felt like I couldn't participate in them and breathe into them until they were like halfway done. Um, and they were starting to like taper off in intensity. And so on one hand, I knew that I, like, I couldn't help fighting them and that that wasn't going to be helpful. I knew from previous experience that fighting contractions leads to things taking forever. Um, I also tried like standing up again. It didn't get better. It was still really, really intense. And so I kept thinking like, oh, try you know, just a couple more contractions in this position. And then I'll make a decision. And I was like, you know what? I, I've made my decision. I'm going to get an epidural this time. I'm going to find out what an epidural is uh, like and what all the fuss is about. So I called the nurse in and they got the ball rolling, called the anesthesiologist um, and started bolusing um, a bag of saline. Um, I wasn't sure how long that was going to take. She's like, keep your arm low. Um, <laughs> So I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I'm not going to move this arm because I don't want things to get kinked. Um, anything that'll take longer than necessary, because if you've had an epidural, you probably agree with this, that like the, the time between deciding you want an epidural and when you actually get it is like the longest half hour of your entire labor. Um, but I got the epidural placed around, um, 4.30 PM. Um, and the, it was a male anesthesiologist, the only male on the entire team. Like my OB is a man, but he wasn't there um, that day. Right? Actually, I think I heard someone mention that he walked down the hall, but he didn't see me that day. Um, I was with a midwife care the whole time, which I really like. Um, and I was actually the same midwife who delivered my second baby. Um, so that was a nice little thing. Um the male anesthesiologist and my husband were like chatting and like talking about how it works and stuff, which was useful information. It was just weird that like the, the tone in the room suddenly felt different. It was like a different vibe. Um, felt a lot more medical, which like obviously you've got an MD in the room now. 
Um, but also like I, people were talking past me a lot more, it felt like, or maybe I just was more absent from my own experience. I don't know exactly. Um, I know that I got the vibe that my husband was suddenly feeling kind of useless, which I, I hated to see because he was my rock. Um, through both like I still wanted him there but he was feeling like there was less that he needed to do um the epidural when it went in I felt a couple of little like nervy twinges on the right side of my uh spine so I knew that it was heading over to the right side and even from the beginning for whatever reason the contraction pain was sort of radiating from one spot on like my lower abdomen on the left um so that was still a hot spot after the epidural was placed, but the intensity went way down to like a two in just that spot. I could still feel my legs, this right leg, like I said, it was, went to the right. It was a little bit more numb than the left, but not too bad, just, you know, a little bit. It wasn't warm, I don't even remember, but I knew I could still feel my legs and move my feet and all of that. Um, but I just had a little hot spot here. So we started out laying on my left side. Um, I made sure to get the peanut ball in place because I knew that if I couldn't feel um, my SPD pain, that it would only jack up my pelvis worse the next day. Um, because that was one thing that all the flipping back and forth without a peanut ball in my second labor, I had a lot of SPD pain for the next few days. Um, because that does take a little while to go away. If you've ever experienced that, that's the symphysis pubis dysfunction or um, also known as pelvic girdle pain it's really sharp and uncomfortable and painful and uh, it makes rolling over uh, a real ordeal. Um, anyway, I was on my left side and that was helping with the gravity moving things over to that hot spot. Um, but after like half an hour, 45 minutes, I needed to roll over again. And um, actually it may not have been a full it may not have been a full half hour because in my notes here it says 4:45, and I know the note said that my epidural was placed around 4:30. So, at any point, when I rolled over onto my right side, that, that spot started to get bigger, and it was spreading over my whole like lower abdomen on the whole left side, and it was getting intense. Again, I don't know cause and effect, right? So, I don't know if that intensity was because I was already complete, or because I was just in transition. All I know is that, um, though I got checked, I got checked at 445. Um, and I was at eight centimeters already. So I don't know whether all of that dilation happened before or after the epidural, but it, it happened incredibly fast. Um, I don't know if it was the Pitocin or the epidural or both. Like I said, I was fighting things, like my body was fighting things before I had it placed. So, I feel like the epidural probably helped that. It also helped my state of mind. Um, but it, the the pain started to get you know bigger on that side, and the bolus button wasn't helping at all. Um, it only works every ten minutes, you know, to help you from ODing, and um, so it it wasn't touching it really. I think I rolled over onto my left again at some point. As soon as my epidural was placed and I was saying everything was feeling good and my husband started to feel a little bit less useful, he's like, okay, I'm going to run down to the cafeteria um, because like his water bottle he thought was, was um, the, the seal on the cap like came off with the cap and he was wanted to see if you should get it um, exchanged. So he leaves and I'm feeling great and then he comes back. I'm laying on the other side. I'm like shivering. I'm moaning. And I am cradling a, um, it's like the hat they put in the toilet. That's what she handed me when I said I was feeling nauseous. <laughs> I never did end up throwing up in labor, um, but I felt nauseous for a little while there. And so it was like, like that, um, that community gif of the pizza boxes in the room on fire. I think it, in my imagination is when he walked back into the room and things had escalated really quickly. Um, it was around, so 4.45, I was at, eight centimeters, 100% effaced, and plus one station. Um, and at 5.30, they checked me again, and I was complete. Um, I think that, like, they kept asking me to tell them when I was feeling pushy. Um, they said, when you feel pressure, when you feel like you need to push, call us in, because, you know, they didn't want 
me to like have a baby on the floor uh, with nobody there. And I never did. I never felt that pressure, but I think they heard it in my voice and the way I was vocalizing and the way I was shivering um, and how things were getting really intense. They're like, let me check you again. Cause I guess I sounded ready. Um, they, I think, I think that labor nurses can tell a lot by the way you sound. Um, and that's why they checked me. And I was like, uh, well, at least I have epidural now. It won't be as miserable to get checked. So fine, go for it. Um, and yeah, he was right there ready to go. Like she barely had to reach in at all. Um, and once she said, he's right there, you're complete, you're ready to push. I was like, okay, yeah, maybe I could kind of feel a little something. It, it felt to me, if you're this far into the video and you're not okay with TMI, I'm surprised at you. Um, it felt like, you know, when you have like a big poop and then there's like a little poop that's still there, but it doesn't want to come out on its own. And you feel like you have to push it, but it doesn't really want to come. That was the amount of pressure I felt. <laughs> it was like so little. Um, but they're like, okay, you're ready to push. So they got the, you know, the bed converted and all set up and, and all of the you know, drapes and everything uh, ready to catch all the stuff. And they said, okay, let's start pushing. Cause I, it took me like 20 minutes to push out my second daughter. So I guess I, I, I don't think that I had to do any practice. I don't remember doing any practice pushing with this one. Um, I think the midwife read the notes, her notes from last time and, she was like, all right, she can do this. So they set me up and I started, they had me start pushing and I was like, oh, okay, this is happening. All right. And I uh, couldn't really, like I, I was kind of numb. So I started sort of, I, I kind of tensed up my face and went, eh, and they're like, yeah, it's working. I'm like, really? Uh, Cause I didn't really feel like anything, but I was still able to do it, which was weird. I asked for the mirror um, and they pulled that out that helped a lot because I was able to see when what I was doing was working immediately. Um, and so I was able to like bear down in the right ways, um, a lot more efficiently when I had the mirror and, um, he was born at six twenty seven. So yeah, from, it was like two hours that I had the epidural in and things went very, very fast from, yeah, he was about 12 hours from water breaking officially to, to birth um and less than that from they put the pitocin in at 10 30 and he was born at 6 30 so what is that i'm not going to do the math here on camera you can do it but it was a lot faster than last time um and yeah i was pushing for about 15 minutes i think it was only like three maybe four contractions um, and the coolest thing uh, was um, once the head and shoulders were out, my husband was able to pull them out the rest of the way, which was really cool. I think experience for him. Um, I thought that was really neat. They dried him off on me. Um, his cord was long enough that I was able to see his face this <laughs> time. My second daughter, the cord was so short that I couldn't get her up high enough to, she was just like way down here. I was like, okay. Um, but yeah, then, you know, delayed cord clamping cut the cord. I only needed one stitch um, this time, which is great. I can recommend very minor tearing to anyone who would like to try. <laughs> There's not a lot you can do about it in here. I pushed fast enough that I'm surprised I didn't tear more. I think I attribute a lot of it to the midwife doing like perineal massage um, while everything was going. Um, that helped. That also helps with like knowing which direction to push, I think. Um, but yeah, I only need one stitch. And so recovery has been really amazing. I, I don't want to rub it in the faces of anyone who's having um, more of a struggle because yeah, my second one was, a, was more intense. But yeah, recovery was, has been really great. Like I said, I'm only three weeks in. Um, and I don't think the stitch is dissolved yet, but um pretty immediately I felt way back to normal. I had some arm soreness, a neck soreness, like like a shoulder neck area um, from pushing um, and from like, I think the counter pressure I was doing on my legs. They don't tell you about that, but you can be really sore um, from labor and from pushing uh, for a couple of days after. Um, and the uh, SPD, I think has pretty much gone away at this point. I'm still using 
the pillow that I keep between my legs when I'm sleeping, um, uh, just kind of out of force of habit to position my legs. And, but like, I'm able to get in and out of bed, which is amazing. <laughs> um, and yeah, I'm able to like sit on stuff and, and yeah. Anyway, recovery has, has been really good. I guess I can also attribute it to, I can recommend for myself getting a, a pair of jeans that fit. I got these jeans when I was like, I don't even know. Like, I think my second baby was like six months, eight months old, something like that. And I hadn't lost a lot of the weight yet. Um, I used to be like a size four and I went up to like a size eight. And it's just having jeans that fit you, you feel so much better. And weirdly, these fit me almost immediately after. Um, I think I just gained less weight this pregnancy. So again, sorry, I'm trying not to brag, but I'm just saying that like I feel really good in my own skin right now, um, which is amazing. Um, and he's doing well. Hopefully, he doesn't get COVID. So that's that's what this week is all about. But um, but here I am filming this. Uh, I think that's basically the whole story. You can. Uh, leave questions or comments down below um, and I can clarify any points but this was a bit more fast and furious um, I can tell you that Pitocin is intense um, I don't re I don't regret the epidural um, I think that it was an important tool that got me where I needed to be when I needed to be there and I would be open to doing the same thing again um, especially if I was on Pitocin again um, so yeah, I don't really have specific plans of what I would do differently next time because I think this one went really well. He was very kind to me, um, to you know my body. And once the water broke, everything. I guess I think, like I said, dates and probably the red raspberry leaf tea. I don't know helped get my body ready to do that. Um, but I don't know whether or not. I, I guess pitocin works is the moral of the story. Um, and anesthesiologists do God's work. Um, so there you go. That's my story. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I will link um, my birth story from my second baby up here as well as the um, from my first, which I filmed like a year after the fact, but um, both of those for your reference and if you want to hear all of those stories. And uh, let me know if there's anything else baby or pregnancy related you want me to do videos on before I sort of move on to more planner stuff again. Um, if you saw last week's video on setting up this guy, that's going to be a lot of the videos going forward. It's about personal size and my new um, fuzz, fuzz Jasma um, planner that I've been showing you. Uh, that's all. All right. See you guys in the next video on Thursday. Love y'all. Bye.